We are looking at a Bible study on the theme, the head corner stone. And that is taken from Matthew chapter 21, verses 42 to 46. It is a direct continuation of our studies in Matthew, but there are very important messages that God wants to impress upon our hearts from these few verses. And as we look at them, I want us to come afresh as if this is the first time we are coming across this passage. I know we covered part of this last week, but I didn't bring out what I want to bring out today. And that is why it is really important we come with a fresh heart, open mind unto the Lord. It is not only Matthew that recorded uh, this parable uh, or this teaching. We have a record also in Mark as well as in Luke. And we're going to learn all that God wants us to learn in all these places. The key theme in this was the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And rejection is a very common issue in society today. Many people may have experienced rejection, maybe from their family, from their friends, from their uh, classmates at school, from colleagues in the place of work and in the society at large. Today, we are going to learn how we can handle that re those rejection in order to get the best outcome from them. Really, it is a paradox in life that the road to exaltation often traveled through the valley of humility. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11, about the uh, humility of the Lord Jesus Christ and how, as a result of that, God highly exalted him and gave him a, a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every na name must bow. And that reminds us how God works and that if we comply with the word of God like Jesus did, then the reject any rejection we experience in life <clears throat> can actually turn out to our own blessings. The Bible tells us in Romans 8.28, that all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to the purpose of God. If I love God and serve God and follow him and obey his word, and I face rejection in any area of life, I shouldn't be disturbed about it. I should leave it to God and keep following God, and I will see God turn that rejection to promotion in Jesus' name. Now, we'll first look at the example that was set by the Lord Jesus Christ and what lesson we can learn from that. And we'll apply these to two aspects in our life. Number one, if you are facing rejection, what should you do? How should you handle it in order to get the best outcome out of it? Number two, we'll also apply it to ourselves to talk about uh, how we should avoid falling into the temptation of rejecting other people. We should not reject people. We should accept people. We should accommodate. And we'll learn lessons even from here that uh, <clears throat> people that were rejected by others often turn out to become uh, the leaders over those very people. Jesus was rejected by the world, but is now being exalted over all the world and nobody can escape that. Moses was rejected by the children of Israel when he tried to separate two of them that were fighting against one another. Moses says, you are brethren, you shouldn't fight one against the other. And what was the answer they gave to Moses? They said, Moses, who made thee a prince over us? Do you want to kill us like you killed the other Egyptian and buried him in the sand? Moses ran away. For 40 years, he was in the desert uh, taking care of sheep, but eventually God appeared to that same Moses. And the Bible tells us later on that this same Moses that they rejected, God appointed him and made him a prince. 
over uh, the same children of Israel. Think about Joseph. Joseph was rejected by his brethren. He was sold into slavery in Egypt. In Egypt, he was falsely accused and ended up in prison. But eventually, one day, we find the story how these brethren that rejected him, that plotted to kill him, but eventually sold him into slavery, how they came to Egypt and how they all bowed down onto the same Joseph that they rejected when they eventually knew that this is the same Joseph they plotted to kill. They came bowing again to the ground and pleading for Joseph to have mercy upon them. And that sends a really powerful and challenging message to every one of us. You know, the way we see people and the way we evaluate people and so on can make us to feel superior to other people and we can start writing off some people, reject them. The key message God wants to share with you is that be careful about who you reject because the same person who you reject today might become the person you need tomorrow in order to achieve your destiny or your goal in life. Without Joseph, the children of Israel would have perished in hunger and starvation. Without Moses, the children of Israel would have died in slavery in, in, in the land of Egypt. And yet, these were the people that were rejected by the same people. Of course, there are many other people, both in the Bible and in contemporary times, that we can talk about. But on the other hand, too, if you are facing rejection, how should you react? Often people tend to fight and want to prove to other people that I am better than them, that I'm stronger than them, that I understand this, I understand that. But is that the right way God wants you to approach that situation? If you fight it that way, what result are you going to get? What blessing are you going to get? How will it turn out? Sometimes when people take loss into their hand, you find that it ends up messing up that situation completely and destroying any potential good or benefit that could have come out of it. So let's read the passages we have for today. And then I'll go on to comment a little more on some of those points that I've just mentioned. In... <clears throat> In the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 42 to 46, the Bible said, Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head uh, of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof, uh, thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard this parable, they perceived that he spake of, of them. But um, when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. A couple of points stand out as I read that. Number one, it was Jesus that spoke this to them. Number two, what Jesus spoke wasn't a new revelation that has not been mentioned at all. It was written in their scriptures. That tells us these people were reading, but not understanding. They were not following what was written in the scripture because Jesus asked them the question, did ye never read in the scriptures that the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head corner stone. If they have learned it, they wouldn't have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus went on to tell them, what the consequences of that rejection will be upon them in that they will be thrown out and the kingdom of God will be given to another people that uh, bear fruit. Then in verse 44, Jesus Christ points out something very important here. And this is something we all should 
pay attention to, note, and apply to our lives. Jesus says, whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. What was he talking about? What does it mean? Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. In other words, if you want to rise up and fight against Jesus Christ, it is a battle you cannot win. It is a battle that you are going to lose. It is a battle that, because God never loses any battle at all. So it says, if you fall on this stone, fight against this stone, you are the one that is going to be broken, that is going to be destroyed. In other words, fighting against a, a, a God is futile. Satan tried it and guess uh, well, see what has happened. He was thrown out of heaven and he now become demon, uh, head of the demons, uh, roaming about and eventually to be destroyed in hellfire. You can't, there are battles you cannot win. There are battles you should not fight. You know, people today have the tendency of fighting against authorities, challenging authorities, wanting to prove that they are right and the people over them are wrong and that they cannot submit to the people above them. It is a battle that doesn't allow you to win, especially if those people have not done anything wrong against you because it is God that established the authority. It is God that established order. And it is God that gave the command that we should submit and surrender to those authorities. Recently, I was listening to a man of God preaching and he, he made a statement. He says that if a wife doesn't want to listen to the husband, doesn't want to submit to the husband and wants to fight against the husband, that that wife is going to find it very miserable in life because he is fighting against God. It's just like um, uh, uh, Nic Nicodemus, uh, um, well, one of those people that uh, uh, told uh, the Jewish people that were fighting against the disciples, wanting to stop the disciples. He called them and says, uh, brethren, refrain yourself from these people because if this work is of God, you cannot overthrow it. But if you want to fight against it, you may actually find out that you are fighting against God. If you are fighting against someone that God has put there to do something, you are fighting against God. He's not fighting against that human being. And God that gave the command will make sure that his principles are upheld. And you may be the one that ends up getting wounded, getting destroyed, getting uh, hindered. The same thing Jesus Christ told Saul of Tarsus on the way to Damascus. When the light appeared to him and he became blind, Jesus said, it is hard for you to kick against the ghost. You know, Saul of Tarsus never thought that he was fighting against God. He never thought he was fighting against Jesus Christ. He thought, I am fighting against this Peter, John, James, and all these apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the people I'm fighting against. They are not as educated as I am. I've studied under Gamaliel. They were fishermen, publicans, tax collectors. I am better than them, so I could fight against them. But the thing is that Jesus appointed these people. God appointed these people and honored those people, put them in those positions of responsibility. And therefore, whosoever was fighting against them was directly fighting against God. And Jesus appeared to him and told him, Saul, Saul, uh, uh, <clears throat> it is hard, very hard for you to kick against ghosts. What are the ghosts? Ghosts are like things like that has like sharp points at the end like maybe a round object that had very sharp, uh, uh, point, uh, uh, sharp pointing edges. If you kick against it, what happened? Those sharp pointing edges 
will pierce into your, uh, uh, into your flesh and wound you, and you will be the one feeling pain rather than that uh, uh, thing. So that is what Jesus Christ was saying here, that whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, uh, uh, shall, uh, shall be broken, uh, uh, broken to pieces, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And of course, the, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this, they say they understood that Jesus was talking about them. They wanted to lay hands on Jesus and kill him, but they feared they restrained themselves because of the multitude of people that stood by. Meaning that a person can even hear something from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ and still fight against them. That is very dangerous. And that is why I need to be careful, you need to be careful, that we won't hear things like this that are coming from the very mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ and we close our eyes and carry on with our own way and we want to just uh, uh, ignore it so that nobody will think that we were wrong and just carry on our own old ways. It doesn't pay, it doesn't help. In Mark chapter 12, verse 10 to uh, 12, uh, a parallel passage on this had this to say, and have ye not read in this, in this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our, in our eyes. And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. And they left him and went their own way. Two things I want to bring out there. Number one, in verse 11, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Similar thing was mentioned in the accounts uh, uh, in Matthew. In verse 42, where it says, uh, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. What that is telling me is that God is perfectly in control of every situation in the world. Nothing happens to God by surprise or by chance. And so, even if you are rejected, understand that God saw it, he knew about it, he allowed it, and if, he's, uh, if he allowed it, he allowed it for a purpose. It is not your turn to become angry with God, but rather to surrender to God and still follow God with happiness, with joy, and allow the Almighty God to help you in every situation. The last thing then is, uh, or, or is that they left him and went their way. Their intention was to kill him. But when they saw they couldn't kill him, they left him, they abandoned him. There are many people that did that in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. They came, they ate the fish, ate the bread, and yet when Jesus started preaching to them hard things, they all abandoned Jesus Christ and went away. Paul experienced rejection. He wrote uh, one of the epistles that the, the, at the first time he appeared in that place and preached to people in that area, nobody stood by him. Everybody rejected him. Everybody went away. They went to do other things. They went to carry on with other uh, things that, that they wanted to do at that time. And here in this same place, we find that instead of receiving and following Jesus Christ, they went away. What will be my reaction when I hear the word of God? Will I just hear, listen to it and go away to carry on in my old ways without any change? Will I make up my mind today and say, God, today this word has come to me. And your Bible tells me that when his message comes to you, there is uh, uh, just been one thing to do, just to bear. That's what uh, one of the songs tell us. But in the Bible, uh, the Bible tells us that when, when you hear his word, harden not your heart, repent and believe now this might be your only day of salvation. If you keep, keep on prolonging it, keep on giving excuse, keep on playing the game and manipulating, the time may run out and you may find yourself in a kind of situation that you wouldn't like. In Luke chapter 20, verse 17 to 19, 
we have the, uh, the next parallel passage to this scripture. And he beheld them and said, what is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And the chief priests and the scribes, the same hour sought to lay hands on him. And they feared the people for they perceived that he has spoken this parable against him. Again, two things there I can uh, pick up. It's, 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 it's not the first time it's mentioned. It's been mentioned in, this, in the other passages I uh, read before. But let's consider the second part of that verse 18. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Don't allow God to fall upon you out of wrath, out of anger, because he has spoken to you and you refuse. God has given you a long line, uh, a long rope, and you fail to uh, 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 comply. When his time of mercy is over, he just comes with judgment. When he came on Sodom and Gomorrah with, uh, in judgment, they couldn't escape it. They all were destroyed in the fire. When his judgment came upon Pharaoh and his army, the entire army without exception, including Pharaoh himself, were drowned in the Red Sea. This is what Jesus Christ is saying. Be careful. Don't allow the wrath of God to make uh, to fall upon you because of uh, uh, protracted disobedience. It's the same thing the Bible tells us, I believe in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 1. It says, he that is often reproved and hardened his neck will suddenly be broken and that without remedy. So if we are constantly being spoken to, constantly being uh, uh, instructed by God, and we are hardening our neck, we are refusing to, uh, to bend, we are refusing to bow, we are still behaving like these uh, Pharisees and uh, the chief priests, then the Bible says a time will come that judgment will arrive and that person will be suddenly, at a time he doesn't expect, suddenly broken and that without remedy. Just like the story of Herod that was persecuting the children of Israel, not just the children of Israel, but particularly the believers, the Christians. The Bible says when one day came, he, he caught up, sat up on the throne and started giving, uh, making a speech and everybody was shouting, yes, it's the voice of God. <clears throat> it's not the voice of man. Let's obey him. Let's uh, listen to him. So there was an applaud from the people. The people accepted him. The people received him. But what happened on the other end? God struck him dead instantaneously. Worms destroyed him while the people were still singing his praises. Wrath of God can come suddenly. And when it comes like that, there is no human being that can reverse it, that can change it, or that can uh, uh, minimize the impact of it. <clears throat> so what are the few things I want to draw out from this passage before we really go to pray? Well, builders re uh, uh, rejected a stone that later became the head corner stone. That's one message. I want you to bear in mind that the builders are usually professional people. And their professional opinions are usually uh, uh, respected and rated as expert opinion. They've undergone training, qualifications, and maybe had years of practical experience. And that gives uh, their views uh, some measure of credibility. I remember some time ago when we bought a building uh, to convert it to a church. I decided to get a surveyor to uh, come and assess the building and tell us what price that building is worth before we go to buy. I choose a, a somebody, uh, of course, I didn't know too much details about uh, all those people at the time, but I choose a surveyor that happened to be uh, the best in the area. Uh, I didn't know at the time he was the best. It was very highly reputable uh, individual that once he says this, 
everybody just listened. So he went and surveyed the building, surveyed everything and so on, and then told us, wrote back to us that based on his uh, survey and experience, he thinks this building is worth this amount of money. And the amount he said was lower than the amount that the owner of the building wanted to sell that building for. And so I submitted the report to the owner of the building and said, uh, this is the view from the surveyor. He said, this building is worth this amount. And that is the amount we are going to offer you. It took a while before the owner of the building re um, re responded. And eventually <clears throat> when he responded, he said he wanted to object to the view of that surveyor. But on the due diligence he has carried out, he found that that surveyor is highly reputable and that whatever he says stands. And so because of that, he would agree to sell that building for us at that amount. We bought the building and converted it into a church. So the point I'm saying here is that builders are people that will have expert opinion. Those opinions will be highly respected in different areas because they're giving us professional uh, 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 opinion. However, we need to understand that in Job chapter 32, verse 20, sorry, verse 9, the Bible tells us that expert opinions are not always necessarily correct. It tells us that they can also be wrong because that passage says great men are not always wise. Neither do the aged understand judgment. That means that in the same way too, we have experts in different areas of life. It could be experts in medicine, in education, in career, in science, in technology, and they have views. They tell us what they think will happen and what is going on. Uh, but it is important for us to know that those opinions could be wrong and they may not be the real truth that God has in mind for you. And sometimes it may not be that they are wrong. Take for instance, medical doctors may come and say from the diagnosis and my experience, this sickness is incurable. And God would have a different opinion because God says by the stripes of Jesus, ye were healed. And so God can heal the person and get rid of that, medic uh, that problem that the doctor said is incurable. Many people have experienced this in their life. I also have experienced it in my life. And God healed me more than 30 years ago of a sickness the doctor said incurable and that they were going to put me on drugs for all the rest of my life. They didn't put me on, I didn't go, but I was just praying and God touched me, God healed me. It doesn't mean that the doctors are necessarily wrong or they made a mistake. They were using their training but God has a different view on things. And as children of God, we need to go with what God says. So the important thing is that what God has said or purpose is more important than expert opinion. I need to find out what does God say about this and follow that which is said by God. God says the stone which the builders reject will become the head of the cornerstone. And so if people reject me today, I should go back to God and thank God and say, God, um, I thank you because this has happened. You are going to make me the head of the cornerstone somewhere here, somewhere there. And the same thing with you. People are rejecting you. Make sure you live close to God. You obey God. You are submissive to the word of God and rejoice because God will turn that rejection into promotion for you. Now, we can take this, uh, that statement that I've just mentioned there as a prophetic promise that the stone the builders reject will become the head of the cornerstone. Take it as a prophetic declaration for you and for me that any rejection I'm going through today, whether it is at home or in the church, in the place of work, in the society, anywhere, that is going to turn out for my own promotion. I've already cited a few examples 
of people in the scriptures that uh, faced rejection and God eventually promoted them. Jesus that we are studying about today is one of the examples. I've already mentioned the example of Joseph. I've also talked about the example of Moses. Uh, David was another great example. David was rejected. In fact, when you think about the whole story, it goes right back to the time that God sent um, the prophet Samuel to go to Jesse's house and anoint one of Jesse's children as a king in Israel. Saul, uh, sorry, Sam, uh, prophet Samuel went there and told Jesse about this. Bring all your children here. Do you notice that when Jesse brought all his children, David was not among them. That is where the rejection started. He wasn't among them. He was, go and take care of the cattle in the field. Let the rest of us that are senior, that behave well, that are enlightened, stay, stay here and see what Samuel will do. And when Samuel wanted to anoint the first one, God says, no, you are looking at outward appearance, but I am looking at the heart. I've not chosen him. He tried the next, he tried all the sons of Jesse that were there, seven sons of Jesse. Not one of them was chosen. And Samuel asked, are these all your children? Because God has not chosen them. And Jesse said, well, I have one more left. The young case, Roddy. In other words, it could be described as childish. I don't think that that person has stand any chance of becoming a king. And Samuel says, send for me, for him, because I won't sit down until he arrived. As he was coming, God told him, that is my appointed, uh, that is my anointed uh, servant. And he was anointed to become king. The moment King Saul noticed David's anointing, David's uh, uh, skill, and that David had the potential of becoming the next king, that is when the next rejection took place. Because Saul wanted to kill him at all costs. Sometimes he will mobilize 3,000 special forces to pursue uh, 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 David. He will join the army, lead them to pursue. But the Bible said he pursued him every day, but God did not deliver him into the hand of uh, Saul. He faced that rejection. And of course, David came back to become the king over the kingdom of Israel and to rule over even those 3,000 or even more soldiers that were seeking to uh, hurt him. We need to fear God. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So take it as a prophetic promise. If you are rejected, just look forward to the promotion that God is preparing for you. And that promotion will come if you keep your eyes focused on the Lord. If you keep walk, uh, uh, living close to God, obeying God, submitting and surrendering to God. Um, I've already commented on that uh, uh, um, bit that says, whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. And just to remind us that no man can do, no man and no woman can do anything against God's purpose. Saul learned it the hard way in Acts chapter 9, verse 4, when Jesus told him it is hard for thee to kick against the priest. Gamaliel, yes, Gamaliel is the person who is the name I was looking for, whom I thought uh, mentioned whether uh, so some, somebody else. Gamaliel gave a wise counsel and admonition that it is futile for man to fight against God. If you know it is futile, why do you want to waste energy? Why do you want to wound yourself? Why do you want to destroy yourself and spoil your joy and the happiness that you could have enjoyed by fighting a battle that you are not going to win? Because it is against God's word, against God's plan. And God will make sure that you cannot win, no matter how long you fight it for, no matter to what extent that you engage in that battle. 
Kamaliel told these people in Acts chapter 5, verse 38 to 39. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, let them alone. For it is, if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to nothing. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest hap haply ye be found even to fight against God. Don't fight. It is not wise. It is not a good investment of your time, good investment of your energy, good investment of your effort to fight against God because you cannot win against God. The very stone that you reject might become the chief cornerstone, the headstone uh, on which the building uh, depends. So rejection of God's word or being offended by it is evidence of living in error. When you reject God's word, it is an evidence that you are living in error. We are going to call upon God in prayer. I believe God has spoken to us today about this important truth on the head cornerstone. And I believe that you are going to yield yourself and decide to follow what God has spoken. Remember, the key thing God expects of us is humbly walking with him, fulfilling all the requirements that God has, being a genuine Christian. When Joseph was rejected and accused and falsely uh, accused, sold into Egypt and then put in prison, the Bible says he, God was with him. God was with him because he was with God. He maintained his integrity. He held on to the word of God that he knew. He obeyed God in everything. I mean, look at David. When Saul was looking for ways of killing him, on two occasions, Saul had opportunity of killing, uh, sorry, David had opportunity of killing Saul. The man of David said, don't do it yourself. Just give us the command. We'll strike him to the ground and he won't rise up again. And David says, no, no, no. Nobody can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and, and go scot free, cut free. No, nobody. Leave him alone. God will deal with him. God will kill him in a battle. And I don't want to put my hand in, uh, to stain uh, my hand with uh, the blood of somebody that was anointed by God. David maintained his integrity. And that is why God fought for David and then ensure that David became a king over Israel. So make sure that you draw close to God. You maintain humility. You live for God. You allow God to fight your battle for you. And you uh, uh, make sure your life totally conform to all the requirements of the word of God. And that you are not fighting a, on a battle that you are not going to win. Leave everything to God. Just continue to be a Christian, be happy, rejoice, thank God, live uh, uh, as God wants you to live. Don't think that doing like that makes you a fool. No, it doesn't. Because the Bible says God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. When you do like that, you are proving to God that God, I know you. I trust you. I depend on you. I'm relying on you. And I'm handling my case to you. And the Bible tells us that God will always revenge on our behalf when we hand over everything to him. So just talk to God now in prayer and ask God to help you to apply this message to your life personally.